Hello and welcome back to the Stay Standing program. In this presentation we're going to think about healthy bones. The false prevention evidence base confirms the importance of healthy bones in reducing the risk of a fracture in case you have a fall. If you're leading a Stay Standing program, we suggest presenting this topic any time after the first session on balance. And we also suggest combining this topic with our older adult nutrition topic. Suitable presenters, if you're having guest presenters, could be a nurse, an endocrinologist, a dietitian or nutritionist, a naturopath or other allied or medical health professional. So let's think about the problem of low bone mineral density. It does affect more women than men. However, men also suffer with osteoporosis. Of the older adult population with low bone mineral density, 77% are women and 23% are men. Statistically, women are 2.2 times more likely to sustain a serious fracture from a fall, and this reflects the increased prevalence of female osteoporosis. Women's bone mineral density declines faster than men's, especially after menopause. Low body mass index, or BMI, and weight loss are associated with low bone mineral density and increase the risk of fall-related fractures. So in this presentation, we'll consider bones, bone health, and managing the risk of osteoporosis. So what are bones actually made of? Well, the protein collagen provides the soft framework for bone flexibility, and the mineral calcium phosphate provides the hard framework for bone strength. Bones have an outside layer called cortical or compact bone, and the inner material is called cancellus or trabecular bone, and that's the spongy, honeycombed inner part containing the marrow, where the new red blood cells, white cells and platelets are formed. Bone is a living material, and they're constantly renewed or remodeled throughout life according to the demands we place on them. Old bone tissue is broken down and removed, and new bone tissue is added. The remodeling process is regulated by hormones too, like calcitonin, parathyroid hormone, vitamin D, estrogen and testosterone. So what does osteoporosis actually look like? Well, this slide compares the normal bony matrix with osteoporotic changes. The image on the left is magnified normal bone. The osteoporotic changes can be seen on the right. You can see that the image on the right is uh, like an old worn out sponge and if you had a fall on that you can imagine how easily it would be to fracture. The difference between osteoporosis and osteoarthritis I'm including in this presentation because we always have questions about that. So osteoporosis literally means porous bones or holy bones. It occurs when bones lose an excessive amount of their protein and mineral content, particularly calcium. Over time, bone mass and therefore bone strength is decreased and that increases the risk of a fracture. Osteoporosis affects both men and women, but women lose bone density more rapidly once they're postmenopausal. The most common locations for an osteoporotic bone are the hip, the spine and the wrist. Osteoporosis is called the silent disease because many people don't even know they have it until they have their first fall and fracture. The name osteoarthritis comes from three Greek words meaning bone, joint and inflammation. Osteoarthritis, abbreviated to OA, is a degenerative joint disease where joints gradually lose cartilage and bony spurs and cysts form at the joint margins and that can result in joint disorder and pain. It primarily affects the knees, hands, hips, feet and spine and it can develop in men earlier than women. It's also known as a, a condition of wear and tear. So let's just have a look at some x-rays comparing osteoporosis and osteoarthritis. The hip x-ray on the left shows an osteoporotic joint. The bones appear less dense and they're thinning. The standard x-rays only show up bone loss when at least one third of the bone mineral density has already gone. The hip x-ray on the right shows an osteoarthritic hip joint with the characteristic narrow joint space and a moth-eaten or ragged appearance around the edges of the joint, indicating areas of bony degeneration and others of abnormal bony growth, and that would be a very painful condition. So how will we know whether we've got osteoporosis or not? 
or you can have a bone densitometry test or bone mineral density test, also known as dual X-ray absorptiometry or DEXA scan. It's um, the most commonly used test used to identify osteoporosis. And in that test, uh, it's very painless. You just lie down on the bed there, as shown in the picture on the right, and, and the arm of the machine swings over the body and takes cross-sectional images. And from that, they can work out the, the area of bone density in your bones. And from that, they also generate T or Z scores, which they compare with the average of healthy young adults. And um, that score refers to uh, density in grams per centimetre squared. Medicare subsidises bone density testing for people aged over 70 and you can find out more about the Medicare testing eligibility on the health.gov.au website and uh, the other tests they can use to detect osteoporosis include a vitamin D blood serum test. So what do T or Z scores mean? Well, as I said before, your bone density in grams per centimetre squared is compared to the reference population of healthy young adults. And it's normal if your bone density is within one or two standard deviations of the young adult mean. So um, a low bone mass would be if you had more than minus one to minus two and a half standard deviations. Osteoporosis is considered two and a half standard deviations or more below the young adult mean. And severe or established osteoporosis is considered more than two and a half standard deviations below the young adult mean. So the influences on our bone health include diet, physical activity, certain medications, hormones, and then there's other influences as well, which we'll just have a look at. Let's think about diet first. So the most important things in our diet for our bone health are calcium, phosphorus, and vitamin D. We can get calcium, phosphorus, and vitamin D from our food. Sources of food for calcium include fortified soy and rice milk, soybeans, sesame seeds, almonds, orange juice, bok choy, broccoli, collards, Chinese cabbage, kale, mustard greens, and okra. We know that dairy as well contains calcium, but it might be surprising to some people to know that leafy green vegetables actually are a very, very good source of calcium too. Phosphorus is needed for energy production and it helps balance many other minerals in the body, including calcium. And the recommended daily intake of phosphorus is 1,000 milligrams for older adults. And the phosphorus-rich foods include grains, dairy and protein-rich foods like meat, seafood, and nuts and legumes. Let's think about where we can get vitamin D from. We can get vitamin D in deep sea and oily fish, including herring, mackerel, salmon and sardines, and in egg yolks. Some foods are fortified with vitamin D, such as milk, juice products, and breakfast cereals. A range of vitamin D supplements are also available, usually in combination with calcium. Some people are taking a vitamin D tablet every day. Others have an injection once a month or even once a year. And we need vitamin D to absorb the calcium. Let's think about another source of vitamin D. Sunlight in the form of UVB rays shines onto our skin and the cholesterol in our skin absorbs it. And this is converted into a vitamin D precursor, which circulates around the body and allows calcium absorption. Vitamin D stimulates the absorption of calcium from the small intestine and the reabsorption from the kidneys. It reduces the amount of calcium released from the bone and it improves older adult muscle strength, which can help reduce the incidence of falls and the risk of fracture. The risk of vitamin D deficiency is high with age as their skin is less able to produce vitamin D3. Older people in residential care are particularly at risk when they don't get out into the sun every day. The amount of sunshine needed depends on geographic location, season, time of day, atmospheric pollution and skin type. And you might like to think about what the optimum dose of sunshine would be each day. In general, it's recommended up to 20 minutes and they say before 10 a.m. and after 3 p.m. to avoid the risk of skin cancer. Thinking about vitamin D supplements again, the recommended daily allowances are 600 international units for people less than 70 years of age and then a minimum of 800 international units around the age of 70 and then up to 1,000 international units for people who are in aged care or those at risk of a deficiency. 
And you can find out more about bones and bone health and vitamin D supplementation on the osteoporosis.org.au slash vitamin D. Another thing that affects bone health is physical activity. One of the principles of strength training is overload and bone cell production is stimulated by weight bearing against gravity. So we might think about which kind of exercise activities are best for bone health. Now, you know, I've just told you about the principles of strength training and overload. So the the clue there is that lifting something that's heavier than the weight of your own limb is actually going to stimulate the formation of bone. Walking groups are okay, but even better if you can put a weight around your ankle or your wrists so that you're stimulating the load on the bone. Let's now think about medications. There are certain medications that affect your bone health. And before I talk about this, I just want to say, don't just stop taking your medications. Check with your GP before you make any changes. So there's certain medications such as corticosteroids and medications used in asthma, breast cancer and seizures that can affect bone mineral density, particularly when they're taken over a long time. If you're on any of those medications and you think they may be affecting your bone health, you could raise that topic with your GP. Another influence on bone health is hormones. So we are thinking here of our gender and our age. We know that there's an increased risk of osteoporosis with postmenopausal women who have low estrogen because estrogen protects women from bone cell loss. Likewise, men with low testosterone are also at a higher risk of osteoporosis And we found out earlier that 23% of people with osteoporosis are men. People with high levels of thyroid hormone are at high risk of osteoporosis. And postmenopausal women who are underweight are at a high risk of osteoporosis. Thinking about other influences on bone health, when you have a family history of osteoporosis, you may also be at a higher risk of developing it. Certain eating disorders and disease conditions can increase the risk of osteoporosis as well. And these disease conditions might include Crohn's disease, Cushing's and celiac disease. Now, other influences also include smoking and drinking alcohol. Smoking increases loss of bone mineral density by upsetting the balance of hormones and it increases the speed of bone cell loss and it also damages blood vessels, which can impair circulation for healing. Drinking more than two alcoholic drinks a day interferes with hormones for calcium absorption and excess alcohol suppresses bone cell formation, upsets the hormonal balance and leaches the phosphorus from the bones. So the key messages for maintaining healthy bones are a calcium and phosphorus rich diet, getting some sunlight every day, preferably in the early morning or late afternoon, doing weight bearing exercise at least twice a week. And there's other tips we haven't talked that much about. Uh, The ability to absorb the nutrition from our food would be enhanced by taking a a high quality probiotic supplement such as acidophilus and bifidus, Um, drinking less than two alcoholic or caffeinated drinks a day and avoiding smoking and secondhand smoke. And sleeping seven to eight hours a night if you can, because this is the time when our body heals. If we have time in this presentation, you might like to talk about the uh, falls and fractures emergency management. And you may remember the most common fracture sites for older adults. These are the spine, the hip, the forearm, the leg, the ankle, the pelvis, the upper arm and the hand. You might recall what to do if you suspect a fracture and that would be to support and immobilize the injured site to prevent further damage and minimize pain. While you're waiting for the ambulance, if you've had a fracture, leave the injured part as you found it and pack it around to prevent the movement stabilize above and below the fracture site and immobilize it with a splinter sling or a bandage. Monitor the circulation and try and remove the rings if you can if your upper limb is involved. There are plenty of good resources online and we recommend osteoporosis.org.au for further information. There's another website called bonehealth.org.au and of course there's the um, activeandhealthy.nsw.gov.au website which has guides including healthy bones. So thank you for your attention for the Healthy Bones presentation and I look forward to delivering the next presentation for you.